40,000 years of evolution haven't even tapped the thousands of human potential. Godspeed, Spider-Man. <laughs>The last episode ended with the Fiero driving for the first time in 20 years, but with that were some problems. There were some concerns with cooling, or possibly lack thereof, a battery mishap that will get worse as the episode goes on, and the continuing issue of the headlights not popping up. This episode actually starts that same day, directly after the closing shot of part 3 was filmed back in July of 2018. I wanted to test if the radiator fan worked, so I hooked up the trickle charger directly to the terminals on the fan, and it spun right up. So with that weight off my shoulders, I brought the car into the barn to start doing some work. Okay, so the issue that I'm experiencing with the engine that's a little bit concerning to me is the uh, temperature. The gauge in the interior is not working. And I'm not entirely sure if that's just because it's a bad circuit board on the instrument cluster or it's uh, one of the bad temperature sensors. Uh, one of them goes to the ECU and one of them goes to the instrument cluster directly. I'm not sure which is which, but I have replacements for both. So I'm going to replace them both. It'll be really easy to do. And I'm also going to replace the radiator fan switch, which is back here, uh, at some point. I don't have a new one right now, but I'm going to go and take it off and take a look at it, see if I can clean it up and if that helps, if anything. So I'm going to get to work. This first one I'm replacing is for the ECU. I had no idea if it was actually bad or not, but for $10 a sensor, that wasn't a big price to pay for peace of mind. I should note that I didn't use Teflon tape initially because I knew that it needed to be grounded through the engine, but after doing some research, I did put some on off camera, but only putting it on half the threads still makes for a good ground. The sensor for the instrument cluster was next. But after it was replaced, I wanted to verify, assuming the sensor worked, that the gauge will work too. To test it without running the engine, I simply grounded the signal wire, and you can see the needle jump around. Next was the radiator fan switch. That came off easily as well, but it honestly just looked like a normal brass fitting and I had no clue what to look for if anything was wrong with it, assuming that you could even tell from the outside, so I just threaded it back in and plugged in the connection. That did create a bit of a mess when I took it out though. So I put everything back in place that I had to move in order to get access to that fitting, and then filled it back up with coolant to replace what poured out. After that, I wanted to see about the radiator fan issue. I did know that turning on the HVAC blower motor would also trigger the radiator fan motor too, but like I said in part 2 of this series, that wasn't working either. So after taking out all of the electronics and verifying with a multimeter that everything was working on this end, and power was at the wires for the fan, it had to have just been a motor issue. So I took it out and lubricated the shaft and gave it 12 volts with the trickle charger off camera. It now worked as it was supposed to. But the radiator fan still wasn't coming on. I could only assume it had something to do with the relay for the fan which is conveniently placed directly under this headlight. Typically, you could lift the lights manually by rotating this knob, but the knob would only rotate so far before it felt like it was hitting a wall, and there was no headlight raising whatsoever. I'll explain why that was later, but for now, I had to just unbolt all the hinges for the light. The whole assembly couldn't be taken out since there's two bolts on the bottom that can only be accessed if the headlights are already up. The terminals were gross. It's probably just leftover electricity that turned to grease over time. The relay was brought back inside so I could take a closer look at it. So what I found out was that when the power was sent to trigger the relay, which should connect this little tab right here, it wasn't actually going in like it was supposed to, or it wasn't going in all the way, it was just barely moving. I adjusted this little tang right there to be a little bit closer, and now when I send power to it, this is just 12 volts, you can see that it triggers it. And this one right here is the low speed relay that's supposed to come on when the AC is on and the high speed one is this one right here. And you can see that it works just fine too. Both the terminals and plug for the wires were cleaned up and then it was tested out.
we go. The relay did need that slight tap to get it going, but I haven't had any issues with it coming on since then. So it's finicky, but it works. Before I start the car to check everything out, I figured it would be a good idea to go ahead and attach a bolt that was missing for the starter motor. The car was started up and driven to my driveway. The Fiero isn't up to temperature yet, so the fan isn't kicking on automatically, but it does still turn on with the AC blower motor. While waiting for the car to warm up a little more, I noticed that the tack finally moved out of the 4000 RPM position that it was constantly reading, and it was working correctly now. But hey, check it out! The fan is on, and if my camera would focus here, you can see that the AC blower motor is turned off, so that means it's coming on automatically now. That is fantastic that the cooling is not going to be an issue anymore, and I'm so glad nothing as bad is going to- Oh wait, no, that's right! The gas tank started leaking. Everywhere I used regular JB Weld, there was a leak. For the spots where the fuel tank approved steel stick was used, it was perfectly fine. The tank was dropped out of the car and emptied completely out. The original repairs were all ground down, even the ones that didn't leak, because I wanted to use new steel stick everywhere. I made sure the surface was sanded well and was extremely clean of all dirt, grime, paint, you name it. I did not want this thing failing, and I'm happy to say that for the past 8 months, it hasn't leaked once. I am going to buy a proper fuel tank and swap that out, which should be in part 9 of the series, but this has worked extremely well and I would definitely recommend it. There was even a comment on part 2 of the series where someone said they had used it on their vehicle, and I think they said it's been on there for the past 8 years. The last thing to do is add enough gas to see if it'll run. And after making sure that it still ran properly, I noticed that there is a slow drip out of the thermostat housing cap. This is just a radiator cap that GM used for the thermostat, so I was able to pick a new one up at a local AutoZone. Before installing it though, I sanded the ceiling surface smooth on the thermostat housing. Now I can add some gas so that there's enough for a test drive. Kobe is actually going to be the one driving it. He was finally free to come back down to where we live. As you can probably tell, I made sure to clean the windshield this time. And also, there were some comments on the last episode addressing the fact that I drove without tags, but this is a rural part of Texas, and it's only on the street that I live on. That doesn't make it legal or okay though, do know that. Even though it is just for two minute long test drives, I am still putting myself at risk, and I do not recommend any of you do the same. So as soon as the car will be able to pass inspection, getting it registered and road legal is first on the list. So thoughts? Um, the gas pedal takes a little getting used to, but it was really fun. It's cool that this car hadn't run for 20 years and now we're on the road driving it. For the unaware, GM decided for whatever reason to make the pedal double hinged. It's really easy to tilt only the pedal forward thinking you're tilting the whole arm. But in the excitement of having my brother drive the car for the first time, I completely forgot about the battery issue. It slid over again and managed to get eaten away even more by the water pump pulley. This battery is toast, and it sucks that that's $100 down the drain, but lesson learned. So on the battery tray right here, you can see that there is a little rubber piece here, and this is meant to clamp down the battery, but it was not doing its job and the battery was still uh, sliding about and went into the pulley like I showed you. So this is not working probably just because all the rust and the battery is sliding down and whatnot. So I'm going to build a new tray out of angle iron.
And now the tray is ready to be installed. And after using rest converter on the original battery tray, I placed the new one in and started securing it. What I used was self-tapping metal screws to hold it in place. There are three for each upright, so it'll be more than strong enough to hold it in place, not to mention that it's also being attached to part of the battery tray bracket where there is no rust whatsoever. If you don't include my exhaust bracket for my old ZR7S, which is just a rounded off rectangle with two holes, this was my first time ever custom fabricating anything for a vehicle. And it may not seem like much, but it was super rewarding to make this myself. I was pretty proud. All right. I do want to point out that there is no battery strap going around the top of the battery, but it is very secure in there as it is now. And also, this vent panel is going to be covering the battery. So even if it was trying to slip up and out, it couldn't even if it wanted to. But this car is not going to be a track car, so there's not going to be any high lateral forces wanting to move the battery around. It'll just be daily road driving. So I'm not really concerned about that. But I do know that a battery strap would still be good for insurance, but I am more than confident in how secure this is, so I'm not going to worry about that too much. So there's still a few things I want to do on the engine before this episode ends, but right now I'm going to focus on the headlights because those are a little bit more pressing. But are they actually more pressing, or do you just want to have your pop-up freaking headlights working? Yeah, that's what I thought. The headlight was already taken out from earlier, so all that was left to remove was the headlight motor bracket. And after that, the motor was separated from the assembly and put into the vise so I could separate the arm that pushes the headlight up from the shaft of the motor. That was really tight on there, so I had to use a hammer and punch to get it most of the way, and then it just came off easily. And you can see the arm went on like so. There are rivets holding on the two halves of the assembly together, so those were drilled out. Yeah, there's supposed to be some uh, rubber bump stops inside this gear, two there and two there. They're not there at all. I'm, I'm assuming this is them. All this stuff that looks to be disintegrated. Cool. Typically with Fiero headlight motors, the, this gear uh, shreds and just deteriorates, but I'm glad that that's fully intact. So I shouldn't get the new rubber pieces that go in here. That motor I just showed was completely rebuilt off camera, so that way I could look like I knew what I was doing when I show you guys how I rebuilt this one. With it apart as well, you can see it was the exact same story. Back in part two of the series, you can see the tops of the motor spinning with the headlight switch turned on, but there was no movement of the lights themselves. And earlier in this episode, I said that the motors couldn't be manually rotated up, and this right here is why. So the shaft the pivot arm attaches to is actually seized to the casing, not able to rotate at all. So the motor was only rotating the gear as far as it could before hitting the coupler arm thing where it stopped completely. With no bump stops in here, the headlight should still go up and down with the switch pressed, albeit sporadically, but that wasn't going to happen with the shaft seized. So after rigging up some blocks of wood and sockets in the vise, you could see how much deflection there was trying to push the shaft out. It's honestly crazy how it got this way since normally it's supposed to just slide out really easily especially with it being metal against plastic. If it was metal on metal, that would make more sense to me. But oh well, it's out now, and now I can get cracking on the rebuild. The shaft was separated from the gear and arms, and every mechanical component was given a good cleaning with the hose, degreaser, and various brushes. They all looked good, except for the shaft that was seized. It cleaned up really well with the wire wheel though. With that now going in smoothly, it was time to put everything back together. This rebuild kit is from Rodney Dickman, who specializes in Fiera parts as well as other GM vehicles. It comes with new bump stops as well as new hardware, including bolts and nuts to replace the drilled out rivets. The new bump stops were added to the gear and the shaft was hammered into place after adding in the arm. Before putting everything back together, I sanded the commutator of the motor with really fine grit sandpaper to make sure there's a good connection with the brushes. And after that, everything was put back in its original place, but I made sure to use a liberal amount of lithium grease to keep everything lubricated and operating smoothly. Then a thin bead of silicone sealant was added around the perimeter of the casing, just like it was from the factory. 
Before I reinstalled the pivot arm, I wanted to clean it up a bit. This arm came apart just by taking off these little clips, but oddly enough, the driver side motor had an earlier style pivot arm, which had rivets for the joints, so taking them apart wasn't an option. But these cleaned up really nicely after wire wheeling off the rust and painting them black. The joints were greased up as well, and the clips reinstalled, and then it was pressed back onto the motor. Before throwing the motor back in the car though, I have to do something about the circuit breaker and brush assembly. There was an issue of kind of not having any brushes for the motors. I have no idea where they went. But before I take care of that, I want to show you how interesting the circuit breaker is. So rather than having limit switches, this mechanism actually stops by mechanically locking up and breaking the circuit internally. When the headlight can't go any higher or lower by reaching its physical limit, the gear is forced to stop spinning, which in turn causes the threaded shaft of the motor to rise either up or down. These little arms on the shaft force the connection to be broken, cutting off power to the motor for the direction it was traveling. That's pretty neat. This was only on the 84 through 86 Fieros though. The 87 and 88 models had a different design. This motor also had a strange way of dealing with the brushes. On most things with electric motors, they are held in place by being mechanically captured and pushed against the commutator with a spring. But on here, they were glued to these little metal arms with conductive adhesive. So, after sanding off the original adhesive residue, I could apply these new brushes, also from Rodney Dickman. And rather than using actual adhesive, you can also use this conductive pin, which is meant for repairing circuit board traces. So after shaking the pin an outrageous amount of time to get the ink flowing, the ink was painted onto the brushes and stuck onto the arms. And then using an old-fashioned, high-wattage incandescent bulb, the ink was cured after letting it sit there for a few hours. And now, everything can be reassembled. Finally, the assembly can now be put back in the car. It took a bit of fiddling and some manually cranking of the motor, which is now possible, to get it to fit into place. The four bolts were secured down, and then the two wiring connectors were plugged back in. You plug in this, and the headlight should go down automatically. Okay. Okay. This is honestly all I cared about. The pop-up headlights. So the build's done now. Bye! Just kidding, there are still six more episodes in the series. But right now, I wanted to take care of a bit of an oil leak up top in the engine. Most of the grime here is from years ago, but you can still see how it's pretty wet with fresh oil still leaking out. To remedy this, it's just a matter of replacing the valve cover gasket. Moving the intake to the side is required to get access to it, which is no problem, but for the Iron Duke engine, there happens to be the EGR valve directly covering one of the bolts for the valve cover. And honestly, everything in here looks pretty good. There's the typical casting issues of the cylinder head, but that's just GM quality control for you. The reason for leaking is probably because of this cork gasket. Cork was pretty standard back in the day, but there are so many better alternatives now. And I'm not sure if it's because of age or just a typical property of a used cork gasket, but it was a pain to get all of it off. Razor Blaze did a lot of the initial work, but I eventually had to turn to a wire brush attachment on a drill. And just to make sure there would still be a good sealing surface, I used some fine sandpaper around the whole thing in case there was any scarring from the wire wheel. The whole thing was given a good wash and a scrub, and it looked loads better. Most of the cork stuck to the valve cover, but the little bits that were still on the engine were simply scraped off with a razor blade. And now, it's ready for the new gasket. The one I'm using is from the Permadry Plus series of gaskets from Velpro. This also came with a new EGR valve gasket, as well as the hardware to replace the originals for the valve cover. The gasket itself is silicone with a metal insert, making it really solid as well as having a good seal. That was laid on the engine, and then the cover was added on. What do you want?
Then all of the bolts were loosely threaded into place. Then I could go around and tighten them all down. So do you remember back in part one of the series when I explained that even though I have been working on cars since I was 13 years old that I still consider myself a novice in terms of skill set, implying that this whole series is going to be a learning experience for me and that mistakes are going to be made? What the fuck? Oh, you have got to be shitting me. So yeah, that's uh, that's really embarrassing. Typically you could drill a hole and use an extractor to pull the bolt out, and I did that. However, the extractor I used was probably really cheap because the tip snapped off in the bolt. So now there's part of a bolt and an extractor stuck inside the cylinder head. I am going to drill that out when I do a complete engine rebuild at some point years down the road, but for the time being I just left it. And I can gladly say that even though there's a bolt missing securing down the valve cover, there's been no oil leaks at all. So good job Felpro. It's still really embarrassing though. So if it wasn't clear, I tightened that bolt down way too tight. Valve cover torque specs are typically around 3 or 5 foot pounds, and I went way past that. I was honestly super mad at myself for letting that happen, but like I said, this is a learning experience and I want to share my mistakes with you guys. Because if there are people watching that want to start working on cars too, hopefully they can avoid the same mistakes I make. And also for those same people, definitely read the comments of my videos. There are always people that point out some errors of mine that I either didn't know were errors or simply forgot to address. The comments are a great resource. So with the rest of the engine components put back in place, I decided to call it a night. With the barn occupied, I was out in the driveway to do an oil change. I did just do an oil change a few weeks prior to this, shown in part 2, but it is good practice to do another one shortly after when it comes to either an engine that was sitting for a long time like this one, or after a fresh rebuild of an engine. In my case, it's just good to make sure that all the contaminants and sludge are completely out now that oil has been cycling through all the galleys of the engine. And also, I made sure to actually change the filter this time. Ellie. O-ring is not on there. It's probably still in the car. The new O-ring was lubricated with some oil to make sure there was a good seal. And using old oil is fine for just putting it on there. Fresh oil was added and verified that it was at the correct level, but I realized the car itself is not level due to being on the ramps. So after rolling it down and moving into a level section of my driveway, I made sure to check it again. And sure enough, I needed to add a little bit more. And that's going to be it for this episode. The car is really coming along. Working headlights, no more gas leaks, coolant leaks, or oil leaks. There's still issues, a lot of them cosmetic. The car looks like crap, beautiful crap, but still crap. More mechanical work like suspension, transmission work, and other odds and ends is coming, but an issue I'm tackling before those is going to be the interior. Cosmetics aren't the reason for dealing with this first, it's honestly a health hazard to even be in there. So that needs to be addressed right away. However, before that mold is completely gone, I'm gonna hang with it once more. So, until next time, I'll see you guys later.